You're listening to the Good Food CFO podcast, where we challenge the status quo of the food industry, celebrate good food founders who are building businesses on their own terms, introduce industry disruptors, and are redefining equitability. If you're ready to build your financial confidence and join the good food revolution to change the way the food industry does business, you are in the right place. I'm the Good Food CFO and your host, Sarah Delavan. Today on the podcast, I am joined by Gwen Richardson. She's the sales director at Repurpose, a leading retail brand of sustainable, disposable tableware, garbage bags, and soft paper for the home. She cut her teeth in CPG with almost 10 years in the craft beer industry in both the Boston and Bay Area before moving to Los Angeles and putting more focus into sustainability with her role at Repurpose. Gwen has held every outward facing sales position there from entry level sales manager to now sales director and was the sixth person at the now 25 person company. Gwen and I are discussing how she and the repurpose team approach growth and taking on new customers, how being clear on the business's vision and goals support decision making, why she never makes a deal without consulting her Goldilocks model, and how being a quote, persistent young woman helped repurpose grow on its own terms. I am so excited to welcome Gwen to the podcast. Let's get to it. Gwen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Excited to be here. I am happy to have you here too. I was just looking back in my emails and you and I connected on LinkedIn in August of last year. So a couple of months ago, and then had the opportunity to have a chat one-on-one that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I really loved hearing your experiences as the director of sales for repurpose and, and how you managed different things that you encountered in the process of growing the business. And I'm just really excited for you as an industry veteran to be here to share some insights with our listeners. So, so really thank you for your time. Thank you. Being called an industry veteran. <laughs> I, I come in here with imposter syndrome, but I think that's what gets us all to give away too much money. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to bring some power in. Good, good, good. (laughs) Well, why don't we start by sharing a little bit about the brand repurpose and you had shared a little bit of like the history, which I think is important to the story as well. So tell us a little bit about the brand. So repurpose is the leading brand of sustainable, compostable, disposable tableware, garbage bags, newly into soft paper. We are really a retail focused brand and have ambitious goals to disrupt the category a la solo, a la, sorry, Mrs. Myers and the method of maybe 10, 15 years ago that really wanted to bring branding into a category that was either filled with Clorox and chemicals, et cetera, or maybe you're sort of like your mom's green cleaning with vinegar, et cetera, and really being bring branding and fun and and truly disrupt a category that was filled with legacy players. And we are trying to do something similar and say, you know, you and your parents and grandparents have been using solo hefty China Dixie for a million years using these single use plastic, sometimes styrofoam products. And can something be on shelf with the same quality with a competitive price and show up where you shop? And can we disrupt in a similar way to bring something better for you to the shelf. I know a lot of, you probably talk to a lot of people literally who sell food Mm -hmm. and this is a sort of less talked about section of CPG us over here in non-foods, but we really come from this place of if something is made to literally be used once and thrown away, can that be the greenest thing possible? Can that please have an end of life so that when you eat your salad for 10 minutes, your fork is not around for (laughs) millennia? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah, And so we're trying to make really high quality, sustainable alternatives to those everyday items that as much as we wish everyone would carry their bamboo forks in their pockets, that still everyday life just requires a bit of convenience sometimes. So we're trying to just come in here and make a little change and we're up against some very big players in the space, yeah. um, but it's been a, it's been a fun ride. When was the brand founded and when did you join the team? 
So we've been around since 2010, 2012. So our founder, Lauren Groper, who is just absolutely amazing. She has a really amazing background in sustainable architecture. And in fact, her career in architecture kept her afloat at repurpose for the first few years. <laughs> and there was an iteration in maybe food service, but because she has this background in design, really wanted to be a brand and not just be the plate at the salad bar that you just grab on your way out, but be a, a, a household name. And so there was a couple of years in playing in food service and then it was okay. Can we get in here and be a brand repurpose had a placement, I think in Gelson's early on that I want to say involved maybe a little self-distributing. Okay. <laughs> and they had a couple proofs of concept that had them go, okay, let's bring in, you know, at the time it was just founders. So like three founders and said, let's bring in, let's hire a salesperson that actually knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, that turned out to be me. <laughs> I had been in the craft beer industry for almost 10 years, which is where I really cut my teeth. It's where there's so much competition, so much competition. And it's where there is so much pay to play, which mm -hmm. is an interesting space because it's technically illegal there because it's alcohol. And so the ways in which the pay to play still dominates though it's illegal also brought a lot of what I bring to repurpose to eventually to the table because I worked for a small organic brewery we couldn't afford to pay to play also you're not supposed to but mm. everyone finds ways to do so and so I wanted to you know keep the brewery afloat and do what I was doing I eventually needed to just get out of craft beer because it's fun in your 20s but maybe not in your 30s <laughs> And I became a draft tech, for instance, and learned how to take apart draft systems and put them back together. Or if someone says, the keg is foaming, what can I do? And I can go in and change a coupler and change out the equipment. And yeah. A, being a female that was doing that at the time was like kind of a novel thing, but I couldn't pay to play. I did, A, didn't have the money anyway, just as a brand, but could I bring different types of value? to still have us being able to play in this arena that had a lot of big brands and big breweries who were playing as smaller brands, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> acquiring small brands and then bringing the big money to them. And so I would go, Hey, like you called me last weekend to change out your coupler. I got some, a seasonal brew beer I'm trying to sell here. What do we, yeah. you know, I helped you. I saved the day. Can you save my day kind of thing? And then it yeah. felt a little bit like nicer than literally buying them flat screen TVs for the bar and getting on draft, you know, <laughs> interesting, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I had that mentality. I think that when I was interviewing for the position of repurpose, I think that they also liked that I had that kind of mentality of like, there's other ways to navigate without it being the sort of traditional, just put money in my pocket kind of yeah. thing. And can it be more organic and can it be even more like relation based also? Yeah. Um, can there be humans here? <laughs> and so I came on with repurpose. They, they were like, let's hire a salesperson. And so I, I took a kind of what felt like a step down at the time to come in as the first salesperson ever in this company when I was, had been sort of climbing the ranks of this brewery, but I was excited about this sustainability path that they were doing. It felt like a disruption. It felt different craft beer to me, it just felt like, oh my God, every day there's 50 new breweries. Mm -hmm. This felt like I haven't seen anything like this. This feels fresh. This feels new. This feels needed. And it was really exciting to give some perspective to how long I've been doing it, which is going on like, I think six, seven years now. Our early, my early sales pitches involved convincing people that single use plastics are a problem. Mm. <laughs> you have a lot of plastic and styrofoam in your set. Do you know that only 10% of recyclables are even recycled? Do you know that there's this single use plastic problem that these don't even begin to biodegrade for 500 years and people going, oh, I didn't even think of this stuff. And I'm talking about meetings with like the fresh market and Bristol mm -hmm. farms. And I'm not talking about meetings with at the time with Albertsons and Kroger. And I was just going, I can't believe this is the whole first quarter of our pitch deck was this is a problem. We're here with a solution and people right. going, eh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> wow. From the beginning as a brand 
repurpose wanted to be in retail stores to be accessible. It sounds like to yes. consumers. Yeah. So we really had this vision of be becoming a brand name, becoming a legacy brand, which was interesting because that's not necessarily what I was doing before. Yeah. Um, because the mission before was get as many farmers who are growing beer ingredients to like go organic. It was like building it, but here it was more, can, can there be a legacy brand in the space that's filled with polystyrene styrofoam? Can a legacy brand come in and disrupt and be another household name? Yeah. And within probably my first year at Repurpose, we saw that as being something that we could actually envision because we didn't actually come up through the co-ops and through the infras or through Whole Foods. We came up with our first national placement through Albertsons. Hmm. And we were like, this is a place where we need to come in with in traditional grocery because that's where people are buying the styrofoam. Mm -hmm. They're not buying, you know, if you're shopping, if you're a co-op shopper, you're yeah. probably avoiding single-use plastics already. I don't need to convince you it's a problem. But yeah. can we show up where everyday people are picking up styrofoam and be right next to it? and be right in that same place. And so it was immediately this big sort of like, do you have the money <laughs> to do this thing? Cause it's one thing to grow organically one store at a time, get your little following cause you're doing demos, et cetera. This is not a like category that's easy to demo. You can't eat the plate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so it was kind of an interesting entry in that grassroots wasn't, wasn't our entry point. I find this so fascinating because I'm thinking that like there are a lot of listeners who can relate to being a disruptor, needing to educate and kind of compare what's currently, you know, on shelf in their category versus what they're creating and trying to offer. So really purpose driven. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting though, that you all went Albertsons, right? Where <laughs> a lot of the brands that listen go, okay, my shopper isn't at Albertsons or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to go where my, I know my shopper is. So you guys sort of took almost a more difficult path and a more expensive yeah. path as you noted as well, because mm -hmm. you're like distribution then from day one with Albertsons, I'm assuming. Like you were working. Yeah. With so yeah. yeah. And that was through this, I think at the time, maybe like a CNS type network, and that was just with one SKU and it immediately was sort of put up against at the time, Solo's version of having a sustainable cup and lid set. It was called Solo Bear and okay. we did better than it. And we were going, oh, hey, these big boys might come in here and try to do it because they know sustainability might be a thing, but shoppers see through it. Do you want your compostable cup from the maker of your red cup? Right. <laughs> Probably not. And so that was a bit of a proof of concept, but it was also like, wow, this is a very expensive avenue. We need to do more than one SKU in a thousand doors or so. <laughs> What's next? And so then we really kind of looked at the specialty channel, the sort of the fresh markets, the Gelson's, et cetera, of the world. And that for us opened up the world of your UNFI and your Kehi and where we had to run numbers in a way that we had to say yes or no to things Interesting, um, because we didn't have the capital. We didn't have huge numbers to just drop in any given moment, but felt confident that we could come in and pay our rent on shelf mm -hmm. and say, let us show you that we can be productive. And to those that are ready to be ahead of the curve and say, we see this trend coming let's give it a shot. And that's where, for instance, like the fresh market was a bit of a turning point for us to go. We can get multiple SKUs in here. We can sit right next to Chinette and be what they consider successful. And so we had to have a couple of those little success points to say, just start being able to maybe negotiate and push and say, this is a thing. Yeah. We're doing this. So um, I want to go back to what you said about running the numbers and deciding like what you could or determining what you could say yes and no to, because I think that's a really difficult thing for founders to do, but we've had a couple people on the podcast now who've, who've shared about this. And I think the more we talk about it and the more we talk about like 
what did it look like to look at the numbers, yeah. you know, in, in some detail, it can be really helpful for people. So I'm imagining it's, you're wanting to get into a store or you've, you've pitched a store and now it comes down to what are they going to pay us and who's the distributor? Can you just kind of talk right. a little bit about, yeah. maybe give an example? And this is actually exactly why I'm excited to be here because and why I connected up with you and this sort of brings back the beginning of the conversation a little bit, which is that I think one of the, the issues here in CPG is that we all operate in these silos mm. and we all have such similar goals. We want to bring something to shoppers that we know is going to improve their lives, that they're going to love, that's going to have this great experience that is better for you, better for the planet, better for the farmers, et cetera. But we're in our silos being told by retailers or by brokers very often, you just got to do it. You got to do the thing. You got, you want it, you got to do it. Yeah. And it just doesn't always work. We want to stay afloat. I want to pay my employees before I pay UNFI. Yeah. <laughs> As an example, like, like I love my people. I don't know the people over there, right? Yeah. Like I want to do this, this thing. And these silos, I think, are one of the things that allows some of these bigger companies to just keep doing what they're doing because we're not talking to each other. Yeah. So let's open these silos. Let's hold hands. I want to be here and like hold some people's hands, right? Yes. Like yes. what's the tools? And so something, for example, that we did early on, and I don't come from any type of like, I have zero Excel skills. It's just terrible. I took art classes instead of computer classes in high school, big regret, <laughs> but running the numbers and going, okay, let's, let's talk about slotting. Slotting more or less promises that hopefully you're on shelf for a full year. So if that's all you know you're going to get out of it, make sure you can afford it mm -hmm. because you're not, you might not get that second year. So like slotting is not a something that like eventually hopefully shakes out for you in two, three years. So we looked at it as let's put in our worst case scenario velocities, the numbers of doors, the exact items, the cost of goods, put in 15% OIs, put in some MCBs, assume some promotions, and then see 12 months projections. And this was me like working with someone who had like kind of learned to be an analyst. And I was like, what if this cell can do that thing? Like, yeah. this was like very early on. I was coming from craft beer where I literally was like changing out kegs and like selling six packs. So it just was like, <laughs> I was like, I think that this is a thing, but I know that we can bring, like, I don't, even if I got approval from my CEO, I don't want to do something that I know I like, I want to keep my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so can I shake, show this, that this will shake out that in the time in which I can at least guarantee it'll be on the shelf that we'll have been able to pay some bills with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we really had, we turned these into some really tight models we had what we called our Goldilocks models, which was like bad, better, best. Okay. And so we would have like the top grid was like bad. And we'd go, bad would be, this is what they're asking on slotting. This is what they want from us. This is how many promotions they're asking. And they're also asking for these ads. So put in worst case scenario. Yeah. Oh man, that has us at negative 20% margin at 365 days into it. Like do we need this? Is this important for us? What is the definition of winning here? If winning is being able to continue to purchase product yeah. to sell yeah. to other customers, then we're not winning. We're not doing it. This one's out. Yeah. So we had our sort of bad, better, best models, our Goldilocks models. For me, it was about just being really honest and going, I'm not a salty snack. I don't have the same velocities. I know there's a place for this we can't be held to the same slotting requirements as blah category or as mm -hmm. blah type of thing, but I can do this and just come in with a number and be really frank to go, I, this has to be in the black. I have to make this work. Can we work together? And also if I'm putting it all in slotting, what do these buckets mean to you? And is it more important to you as a retailer X, Y, or Z that you're filling these buckets because your manager is like, get lots of slotting or can we succeed together? So can yeah. we say, hey, if slotting is going to be $50,000, let's do 25 for slotting and set aside 25 for promotions. Yeah. 
to put the dollars in the hands of our shoppers to make something actually succeed. And we have found that the best retail partners are the ones who actually don't even ask for slotting because they just want to sell product. They <laughs> make money by selling product yeah. off the shelf. Yeah. And that's where, you know, where we want to be and where we want to partner and being able to say, this is all we have to bring to you. Yeah. So you would make your models and if things weren't going to work out, you would, you would go to the buyer or whomever in the relationship and say, essentially, here's where we need to be, or here's what we're mm-hmm. proposing. How many times would you say that they agreed to it? Like what percentage of time did you have a successful negotiation? If that's a possible. Most. Good. Most. Okay. Amazing. Honestly. That's yeah. Amazing. And we always were so nervous and we were just going, man, hopefully they don't think that we're crazy Mm -hmm. because we had had and continue to have brokers who are just another sort of interesting side of this industry. I think, again, it's another place where like the retailers aren't asking you, Hey, are you keeping the lights on with Mm -hmm. your margins? And the brokers aren't asking if you're keeping the lights on with their margins. And they of course want to see your portfolio build, whether it be organically or inorganically, what have you. We have had brokers who say, this is a bad idea. Don't Mm. negotiate this. They told you it's two cases slotting. So don't take the meeting if you can't do it. And we say, no, we're negotiating it. Yeah. We know exactly how much we can put into this and we still think that it can be a success. And we also know that this is a need at this point, but you're going to lose shoppers, especially when you're talking about like mainstream and when you're talking about bigger chains, you're going to lose shoppers to Whole Foods and co-ops, et cetera. If you don't have an alternative, people that are not picking up styrofoam anymore. And the people who want alternatives are also your higher dollar. They're also the people who are buying your beautiful other CPG brands that bring you those better net dollars, right? Because they're maybe higher price points, but it's a big basket. And we come in and we say, we bring this bigger basket to you. You have a valuable shopper from the repurposed shopper or from name your amazing CPG brand. These are the, these are the shoppers that these retailers want coming through their stores. I think this is so important because it's, knowing your numbers, right. And knowing what works for you before you agree to onboard with someone and it goes beyond, okay, this is the slotting fee. And so where am I going to come up with this money? But what does this relationship actually, you know, look like financially over 12 months would I I like the more people hear this, I think the more people are going to start building those models for their own brands, which is amazing. But then also the idea that you can negotiate, like retailers, the buyers, distributors, smaller brands and young, young founders, young meaning new in business, right? A few years in business or approaching distribution for the first time. One of my clients, and I say this a lot, she said, you know, I felt green and grateful the first time I was working with the distributor. Right. And she learned lessons and, and learned that like, she was never going to feel that way again. Right. You have agency, you have the ability to go, you know, that doesn't work for me. Here's what does here is why, and here's mm-hmm. why it's going to work for you as well. And I think that second piece is really important. And, and, and you pointed that out, right. Where it's like our margins on this product are going to be X, Y, Z, right. So, you know, for all of these reasons, this is why this is not just a good deal for us, but also for you. Yeah. And if they're the right partners, they're going to listen, they're going to pay attention and they'll, you know, move forward in a way that's mutually beneficial. And I think that's what, that's what I want for CPG brands. You know what I mean? Is mutually beneficial relationships financially, you know, and you know, something that we've run up against recently is like distributors and retailers, not disclosing how much the distributor is selling a product to the retailer for like literally calling and asking and not getting the information yet. The retailer is asking for an EDLP of a certain value, or we want it to be five cents more this year. And it's like, well, what's going on in this relationship? (laughs) Because, because this is going to cause us to lose money. Right. So there's also this lack of information. I mean, that just popped up recently. So it's top of mind for me, but pushing back and going, I need to know 
because in yeah. order for me to make this work and for us to make this relationship work, this is information that's vital. Right. In fact, I, I sometimes lead with such a literal level of transparency. I was having a flashback to, I was doing a bunch of hat in house shows before UNFI bought, acquired them, you know, a few years ago. And I was so nervous going into them because again, we were just so tight budget at, at the time. And so I went in with my model with this, with my spreadsheet on my laptop. And like, I hate when people are on laptops at trade shows, I'm like, close your computer. <laughs> but I was like, I'm using this as a tool at this show because I'm talking to so many retailers and I'm going to have my model ready to go because people say, get your best deals ready or your trade yeah. shows. And I'm going, yeah, but like, what does best mean? Best for who? you know, what, what's my goal here? And I just went in going, I will not do deals at this show that are not profitable. And so these retailers would approach you and you get the whole gamut because it's up and down the East coast. So you get the like different personalities of negotiations, you know, <laughs> my favorite part of CPG is probably just like <laughs> the regional personalities and how they like to negotiate. And so I just had my model and they would go, okay, so you can do a, you know, buy one, get one, a BOGO, give me you know, this 25% off or 50% MCV. And I would go, let me just plug in, plug yeah. that into my model. Da, 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 da. That would mean negative $200 for me. I, I don't know if I can do that. And they'd go, oh, really? I don't want you to be in negative money, you know? And yeah, I'm okay. going, great. Fascinating. <laughs> Cause I, I think that's so important to like put the like, highlight on as well. Like they don't know like they people no who are trying idea. to negotiate with you. <clears throat> they also, if no one has been telling them, this is the effect of you asking for that. And like, th then they have no knowledge either. Like, well, this is the way it's always been done. We always yeah. ask for this promotion. You know and what I mean? Felt very empowering to literally just flip my laptop at them and go, I did it. Well, here's my numbers. Yeah. That's negative money for me. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, that's why when you said, like, do most, can you get through these negotiations? And I think it's, and I find it to be yes, when it's with that sort of like, let's hold hands here. Yeah. Let's yeah. build something that's mutually beneficial. And if you don't know that it's literally putting me in the negative, why wouldn't you ask for more dollars? But when people really kind of see this, when that human connection come in and they go, wow, you are a small brand and you're not like Reynolds over here. And I, I want to see you guys succeed. I like this movement. Yeah. Let's not do this. If it, if you literally are paying us to do so. Yeah. What we often see is someone will, you know, a retailer, whether they're online or brick and mortar or whatever, they'll say, uh, this has happened recently. <clears throat> we get a 50% margin. So, uh, how much can you discount your product to us so that we can maintain the 50% margin? And it's like, well, you can sell our product up to X number of dollars in retail. So we're selling it to you for this price. And then you can sell up to, let's say $18. Right. We've had those retailers come back to us and say, no, no, no. We want to match your price that you sell your product for online. So how much are you going to discount your product to us so that we can get our 50%? And I encourage people and so like you sharing your story today makes me feel like, okay, we're doing the right thing because I, <laughs> I encourage people to say, here's the effects financially of me lowering my price for you to get 50% margin. My margin is X or I, you know, I'm I, like, this deal doesn't make sense for me right. this way, but I'm saying that you can sell my product for up to, I'm just using $18 as an example you know, and if this doesn't work for you, then it doesn't work for me. And people will say, you know, but it's such a great opportunity because it's such a great retailer or it's such a great, you know, online site or whatever. And it's like, is it a great opportunity if you can't make money there? Right. Right. Like, and yes, people, I know people will say like, sometimes there's marketing opportunity and it's exposure, but if it's going to cost you money, how much money is it going to cost you? Right. Like really run the numbers, really kind of take away the emotions, I think from it and, mm -hmm. and examine it for what it is. But I think, you know, putting it back and going, okay, if you want 50, like, this is the reality of that. Are you comfortable? Are you okay with putting me in this position basically, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and making it 
instead of black and white, black and red. Like mm-hmm. there's a certain amount of red that maybe is okay, depending on your goals, but to really say like, what does winning mean to yeah. me or what does success mean to me here? And in some places we make those sacrifices because we understand how it feeds into the greater goal. But mm-hmm. there's also times when you run the numbers and it doesn't shake out yeah. and you just can't do it. And we get, you know, it's working with the distributors is a whole nother level where they're going, Oh, fill our buckets and do these ads and do these promotions. And, and I, there's something that has been lost along the way in terms of really saying, can't we all prioritize the shoppers? Mm. Can we all prioritize our customers? And you know, I, I have to do the same sort of negotiations annually with like you and I and Kehi to go, I want to grow our sales together. That's my main goal. I want you, you and I Kehi to sell more product to the retailers who I want to sell more product. Yeah. And the only way in which that works is for the shoppers to buy more. And so I understand that you want me to participate in more ads. I've run the numbers. There's not an ROI let me put my dollars into scans at the retailers that work that buy from you and let me contribute to you in that manner. (laughs) I love this so much because again, it's like knowing your numbers and not just knowing them and going, I'm not going to do an ad, but saying, I'm not going to do that, but I am going to do this. And here's the benefit to you. I mean, that's a theme that I hear in what you're saying is that you can come to the table with information and be persuasive. Right. And, and I think when they know that you want to help them, you're trying to have everybody (laughs) win, right. As well as the customer, then it's hard to say no. Yeah. And we don't, we just, one of my sort of policies is I just don't want to fill empty buckets anymore. So, you know, if whether it be a retailer or a distributor is trying to sell me on a program, I just say that I, I can't do something that I can't prove out. So if I do this ad or this circular or this promotion or whatever, what kind of reporting will I get in exchange so that I can see what it did? I can see the lift. I can sell it to, you know, at this point I can approve my own promotions, but there was a long period of time where I had to get everything approved by my boss to say, to sell it to her. I can't sell her an empty bucket. I can't say, Hey, can I allocate $4,000 to a circular that I, I don't know if I'll be able to tell you if it did much. Yeah. And, and it's easy to get starry eyed. I think when you're like, well, you want to fly and they're going to open a DC or, or you get brokers going, you want is not going to work with you if you don't do this. And I'm going, well, my sales continue to grow. So maybe they will. Let's try it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Don't threaten me that we might be blacklisted when all I see is growth, you know? And I have been accused of being a persistent young woman (laughs) in a way that was, was, uh, preceded by saying, Gwen, I'm saying this to you in a way like, you know, I don't want you to change, but some people around here, this is a brokerage you know, they think that you can be a bit of a persistent young woman. And part of me is like, so highly offended Yeah. while also being like, you're damn right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, I I, I am. And that's not a negative thing. Mm. I would like to know what you would call a male. Um, so, but we'll set that aside, but also, yes, I am a, I am going to be persistent. I'm not again, that sort of starry eyed thing where you're like, let me just get this next retailer. Let me open this next DC. Let me pay for this ad because then I'm, I'm participating. But if it doesn't shake out, if the numbers don't work, I I gotta like remove the starry eyed glasses. Right. And just look at the black and look at the red and say, is this going to contribute to what we have established our goals to be? And in some places, again, there's some places where depending on the goals, you make those sacrifices, but you have to be really conscious of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think something that I want to touch on is just, it seems like, and you mentioned imposter syndrome when we first got, (laughs) when we first started chatting, but it, whether or not you feel or felt like an imposter, 
it sounds like you've had a lot of courage throughout your tenure at repurpose to not just go with the flow and not just do things the way they've always been done, but to go, hold on a second. I'm going to examine this and I'm going to be honest if it doesn't work for me. And I think that, you know, that's something that I think a lot of people think that they don't have the option to do, exactly. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any like tips or advice, you know, about that? Or is it simply just like, no matter how scared you are, speak up? <laughs> yeah, it's something that maybe comes across as courage that we've sort of defined as the like, sometimes it's literally life or death for mm. the brand, right? Like, what does longevity look like? And do, you know, with this sort of greater goal to really be a disruptor, if we drove, drove ourselves too deep in the red, we're never given that chance because we got to close up shop. Yeah. And so we're not here to just try <laughs> and see how something does. Like we don't have that type of capital to try this and then see what else could come next. I think that sort of a bit of the defiance and the, the like, the why not. And this mm -hmm. is something that actually my, we were at our, our holiday party this year and my COO was making a joke about, about, you know, Gwen always comes in with a why not, <laughs> you know, can we do this? Why not? We can't do this. Why not? Why not negotiate? Even if the two, even if you can afford the two cases slotting, but you know that you could allocate the dollars better by putting them into promotions again for your shoppers for your customers, for your consumers, for the people who are eating your crackers at home, who are using our forks at their barbecue. Yeah. I want, I want to be able to build this movement and drive sales. And are my dollars being utilized in the best way possible? And I've, I think I've kind of always had this kind of thing, which is the like, just ask for it. The worst yeah. you're going to get is no. And if someone says, thank you, for, you know, we told you it's two cases slotting, you came in and offered 1.5, we still need two. You have to be ready to walk away or be ready to say, you know what, I will go to two, but let me try for 1.5. Yeah. No one ever pushes you out of the meeting for trying because yeah. it's the same thing where I just, I was literally having a meeting today where I was like, I'm coming to you with what I propose. If this doesn't get us anywhere close to what you need for us to stay at the table, be as black and white with me as I'm being with you. Yeah. What do you need for me to even approach you? Okay, cool. This is what I need to stay alive. Is there somewhere in the middle? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I've, I, I, I work from this place of always trying to be the most prepared person in the room or the most prepared person at the table. And that sometimes just means running those numbers ahead of time and knowing before you take the meeting, where your stopping point is. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes just, and it's harder these days because it's COVID and so much is virtual. Yeah. And the, all of the stuff is so much easier in person, but to just say, I believe in this. I believe there's a shopper for it. This is the direction things are going in. And I need to do this sustainably. Like we're a sustainable yeah. brand trying to sustainably grow and stick around and have the staying power. And in terms of like what I would say to others, I also, you know, I connected up with you because I saw someone else who was in one of your podcasts. I saw him in this startup CPG Slack mm -hmm. where someone was asking a question. What is someone, how have you negotiated this? And he's like, you don't have to do a wise. They won't kick you out. And I was right. going, hey, <laughs> someone speaking some truth over here because there's so much of this. Oh, well, they asked for two cases of slotting. So you do it. Yep. When you start, when you sign on with the distributor, you do four OIs, 15%, four times a year, your whole entire product line. But if we can really start seeing the voices, whether it be through what, what you're doing here with a good food CFO, with the startup CPG, with that trade shows, like how do we, I love when people approach me and go, I love your brand. I just started this company. Can you recommend some brokers? Hey, I saw that you're in this distributor. Can you tell me more? Or if yeah. I see people in the startup CBG asking, asking questions in the Slack, I want to come in and say, 
yeah, watch out for this, watch out for that. Cause if we don't, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And if there's a way for us to empower each other and hear that there's an option to negotiate, yes. then it's empowering in and of itself. Absolutely. And that's also why, you know, back when we were talking, the idea for the Good Food CFO community had not really taken shape yet, I don't think. And I remember you saying, I want to be part of this movement that you're talking about, about this revolution changing the industry. If I can help people, I, I want to do that. And that was really helpful and informative for me to go. Yeah. I know that I don't have all the answers. I sit in a seat where I run the numbers for people, but I'm not going to the negotiation. Right. So it's easy for me to say, this doesn't work for you, but this would, right. Like see if you can negotiate down to these numbers I'm safely in this office, right? So, <laughs> so, so my words only hold so much like clout, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, she never had to go in there and do this, but you have Brady who you're referring to as, as yes. the person he has and the other founders have. So one part of the puzzle is sharing the story here. And the other part is creating a community where it's not just, you know, the, the traditional community mm -hmm. in a, in the business world is like, you set it up so that people buy your services. That's not what we're trying to do. <laughs> we have resources available because we want to help people. And if you need them, because you're not an Excel whiz like me and a total nerd about it, there are templates there, right. And we can help you, but, and, and we wanted to break the mold and go professionals, sales directors, other founders, right? Other industry experts come, come here and have these conversations that don't sound like all the other conversations happening out in the world, right? This is the place where you can go, this doesn't sound right to me, or I'm scared to approach this negotiation, but I know that I need to, you know, any words of wisdom for me, right? That's what we really want the community to be. And you were, mm -hmm inspirational in going, I think, you know, this idea that I have is a good one to invite as many people as we can from throughout the industry into this space, mm -hmm. because you bring the, 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 I guess like the cheerleading, the support that I've been there, that it is possible that I can't bring to the table. And I, and I want to be you know, again, that sort of imposter syndrome, I'm like, who am I to tell anybody what they like could or shouldn't do, you know, and bat that aside and yeah. go, you know, here in this format or in other places, how do I offer up, whether it be myself as a resource or my experience as a resource, or how can I be that helpful voice yeah. that says, you can push back. I have done it. It's, it's scary every time, but it feels even better when like, you know, like your win feels that much better when it's on your terms. Yeah. You know, it's like one thing to get a retailer that you wanted. It's another thing to do it and know it's going to be profitable. Yeah. It feels so much better when you, when you end up giving in there into everything and you're excited for the 150 doors or whatever, but you also know it's all it is, is a retailer under your, under your belt and yeah. no dollars and you're going to have to find other ways to keep the lights on. That's a big bummer. Yeah. So how do, and this is a world of small, of small brands that are, we're the ones disrupting. It's the small companies, right? Mm -hmm. And this will, these spaces will never be disrupting. The amazing products can never get to shelf if yeah. the small brands continue to have less and less power. And so my like, and on top of what you were just saying, which is the like, there's resources, you don't do it alone, is the like, how does this kind of collective also have the power to push back yep. as a group? Because I can't go to UNFI and go, I have a real big problem with one of your policies. That is, for example, that you can buy less products during the OI period that you sell out your distributor during that time out of your DCs during that time. So you can bill me back per case, the excess that you sold in addition to 
what you didn't have enough of during the OI period. But when I see that you bought more during the OI than you sold, can I bill you back? <laughs> no. And like, this is one of many sort of things that just feels yeah. like how are, how are we not all working towards this same sort of thing where like, aren't we all just trying to move some product and get, get the best product at the best price that we can all afford to our shoppers. Isn't that the definition of organic growth? And, and how can I be a resource to a small brand, but how can we also lock hands and find a voice to go, Hey, big company X, Y, or Z. We have some problems with a few of your policies. Yeah. And I can't, I don't have that voice alone. You don't have that voice alone. Seventh generation doesn't have that voice alone. Yeah. But do a bunch of us. And that's my next sort of like thing that I'm tinkering with is the like, we all agree this is unfair and very painful for our books, mm -hmm. for our ability to bring these amazing products to shelves so that people can bring them home. Yeah. And it, the barrier to entry just becomes higher and higher and higher. Yeah. It is, you know, something I said, I, I think in a previous podcast is like, there's no accountability <laughs> for the distributor in so many ways, right? Like they'll bill you back, but there's no, like you are unable to bill them back, right? They have no accountability for over-ordering. They have no accountability for losing your product. They have no accountability an example is they're currently, they bill us more if our fill rates are low, but then when we see that their fill rates are low, so we're losing sales because they're not getting the product to the retailers. Mm -hmm. We're just as out of luck. Yeah. And it just feels like, and then someone on my team was like, well, we just, we just don't pay them. I'm like, that's not how it works. They no. take the money from our checks to hunt it down and get it back the resources that it takes to do that oftentimes are just not worth it. And that is just, it like hurts my heart for I've now been in Unify for like 10 years. I've been doing it for seven. We've built up a certain amount of volume with them that like we're cool. Yeah. But to the, a small brand with those type of barriers to have to resource in order to be able to dispute something that you don't get responses for, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a whole nother layer of like, we were talking about negotiating with the retailers, but the, this, what you're talking about with these distributors, it just, how can we hold hands and bring some of this unfairness yeah. to light and, yeah. and push on it? Or how do I talk to other brands to say, watch out for X, Y, and Z or negotiate this thing into your contract because yeah. it will bite you later. I think not, I was going to say a big part of it, but I think a piece of it is, you know, you're challenging promotions and slotting fees and things. And I think it's not accepting, and I don't know what this looks like exactly, but not accepting the standard contract of a distributor. Right. And, and gosh, it's just like, yeah, if we, you know, over order, you take it back and you pay for everything and you'll also pay right. for our storing your product. And yeah, we have no, there's no, right. we have no responsibility for that. Like that's part of the contract because they, we're, that doesn't work for us, but you're right. Like one tiny brand saying it, it holds no clout. Like, okay, well, if you're not going to sign this contract, then like, we don't need you. There's another person mm -hmm. in line. And so every person in line needs to go, nope, we're not doing it either. You know what I mean? Exactly. There, there has to be a banding together, even if it's not like an entire group of people, which I think obviously has a lot of power, right? But if it's everyone agreeing, okay, right. we're not going to do this, right? We're not going to sign these contracts anymore. These are the things like, where, where do we get our hands on a contract? <laughs> where can we redline this thing and go, here are the things that we, we're uniting together to right. not agree to these things. Like maybe that's step one. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we just, I don't know. That's just an idea I yeah. had just like right now, but like, like, how do I put up the bat signal that says don't do, if you're considering business with this distributor, watch out for blah, blah, blah. 
in your contract. And again, this is where like our brokers, this persistent young woman thing comes in as they're going, <laughs> just get it going. They want yeah. you in there. They're going to open up some Indies. And there have been a good five to 10, maybe small distributors that we've gone. No, mm -hmm. if we, if you're not okay with the red lines that we've put through this contract, we cannot afford this. You need us to deliver it all the way to the East Coast from our warehouse in Southern California at our FOB cost and do quarterly promotions and give you a 60 day intro allowance and free fill all your new customers who maybe already buy it from KE and UNFI. And you need us to do your, your food show and we're not a food brand, so right. our buyers don't go. <laughs> right. And you need us to be in your paper ad who reads those anymore we're all online and we just go we've put some red lines through this yeah this is where we're i mean you approached us so here's our red lines and if you don't like it no you're right we're okay yeah not we're not gonna, gonna do it. it yeah and my sales team oftentimes goes wait gwen seriously we're not gonna get into this retailer because you're not gonna get into this distributor and i go this time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you know, I think you know, the other part of the community is that we want to invite retailers in, you know, yes. um, I don't know right now who those people in the retailers are, but I would love to get their attention, right? Like in order for change to happen, I think what you're doing has to continue to happen and move up the chain in a sense, right? Where you're telling a buyer, who's, uh, you know, at a trade show, I understand why you're asking for that. Here's my model. This is why it doesn't work for me. Right. Mm -hmm. That conversation I think has to keep on going because right now it's happening on, I'm going to say the bottom level, just because it's right. Like sales, it's very transactional. It's down here. Mm -hmm. People at the distributors, the people that we're dealing with at the retailers, they're doing their jobs. They're doing what's asked of them by the totally. people above them. Right. And even, I mean, in many cases, probably even if we enlighten them on this is why this isn't going to work for us, their hands may be tied to a certain extent. So we need to elevate this conversation and the awareness of what is actually happening to small brands. And I'm, and at this point in time, I'm certain that there are retailers who are going to be like, it doesn't matter to us. <laughs> like we, I, I once had a conversation with a distributor. I'm going to share this story because I think it kind of represents what I imagine the retailer would say to, to us. I was being recruited to be a salesperson and a distributor. And I worked in like local sustainable, like farm direct, like for real farm direct food. And I had said to the person recruiting me, if I am to join your team, I want to sell the products that I believe in, not standard commodity stuff. I understand that it can be part of the purchasing model, but it's, I'm not going to just be pushing product. I don't believe in. He was totally on board, but you have to go have a conversation with Mr. Senior so-and-so. Okay. And I sat down at this man's in this man's office. And the only thing I remember from the conversation was basically him going, listen, honey, I make a lot of money selling conventional strawberries. I don't make any money selling Harry's berries, strawberries, which is like a really high end strawberry out here. I don't need someone on the team pushing Harry's berries, strawberries. And I was like, well, I don't want a job where I'm pushing conventional strawberries. So I think we have our answer here. Mm -hmm. And I left and I thought to myself, I think that this man's tune is going to change in the coming years because he's just behind he's just behind the trend. Right. And he just knows what's making him money right now. Not what's gonna, you know, drive sales in the future, but I imagine that's what a retailer would say. And, and so we would have to come, we'd have to come with numbers. We'd have to come with, you know, our data, I'm sure. And it's frustrating, but I think you got to try, you know what I mean? You gotta, yeah. you gotta take And that's it there. the thing totally. And that's the thing too, is we, is we, we're not in the habit of taking no's because we know it's a no for now. Yeah. And this is for us in terms of just being in a sustainability category or sustainability subset of our category. 
the wave is going in this direction. If it's a no today because someone doesn't have the vision, can it be a no later? And do I close all of those negotiations? Yeah very professionally and with the best relationship leaving with the best relationship possible to go like this doesn't work for us today and it's always a today but tomorrow as this movement continues moving in this direction as you continue to try to bring this shopper into your door as you need us in your distributor because you've worked with other brands that maybe will pay all these fees but are sub quality etc we're still going to be here and we're still yeah. going to be here because we negotiated these appropriately for our business. And we'll just see you later. We'll yeah. see you soon. And there are quite a few retailers and even distributors now that that initial negotiation was a no, that is now a yes. And are some of our best partnerships because we kind of did it right and did it in a way that allows us again to like put our people in our company first that are here with this mission that want to be building this movement, building this brand and have longevity be our, yeah. our goal. When I think about equitability within the industry, that's what's in my mind right now is like putting your people first, right? Saying we're going to make decisions and not engage in relationships that aren't beneficial to our business and by extension, you, our team, because that's breaking the mold of traditional CPG too, right? Where it's like, don't pay your team well, work them really hard, get the tiny margins that you can and follow the rules. And so you're also saying we're not doing that. I mean, that's something to be proud of for sure. And something that I know that a lot of other businesses are trying to, to model and to emulate, you know, and it, it's hard and it's scary. And, and I also appreciated earlier that you said like negotiations are never not scary. <laughs> like you're never not nervous going <laughs> in, you know, because that's, that's good to know too, that just like, yep, you show up at the table, you are the most prepared person, but it doesn't mean you're utterly confident and not a little bit nervous about mm -hmm. it. And there's always that little voice going, are you crazy? You might walk away from this. Are you crazy? This person has so much power and you're just a little brand and you're going to tell them what works on your terms. Who are you? And you're just going, this is what I got to do today. Yeah. yeah. And, and man, is it empowering after you sweat all the way through it. <laughs> you know, you get like hives and you're like, Oh God, but it's so much sweeter when you know that it works for your goal, the goals of your company. Yeah. And yeah, there, there are, I can always count two or three kind of times where we maybe negotiated too hard. And there are some good chunks of growth that I really believe could have probably been added to our numbers over the years. Yeah. And that would have probably come in, but the margins would have been so slim that would I actually regret that more mm. than if I were today going, we got it. It's in our portfolio. Look at all these doors, but we're going, wow, this continues to be a negative margin customer. I would rather grow organically and get there when maybe that customer is ready or when the, mar when the margins shake out, then give away the barn yeah, or what have you, um, in order to, but, you know, I can't speak for anyone else's goals for their brand and for their company. And sometimes depending on whether you're trying to entice an investment group, or you need this retailer in order to get that retailer, you have to get this retailer because it's just that sort of chain of events. But if you really identify what your big picture goal is and make sure that you're always feeding into that, then sometimes saying no feels good. Yeah. It feels better. The no, we didn't get this feels better than the yes, we did. And I don't know if we can afford it. Yeah. Or doing the analysis afterward and going, we're losing 
X amount, X percent, right. X cents or dollars per unit, you know, after the fact. And then, then the, then the work is how do we pull out of this? When can we get out of this? And how much is that going to cost us? And, you know, that's just a much more difficult situation to be in, I think, than saying no upfront or negotiating. Right. So I think if you kind of compare the two knowing those dollars, I mean, there's a retail group that approaches us at every trade show we go to. Hey, repurpose. Okay. We're in 500 cases. You got to give us this deal. And we're just like, just still no. And I did it with them. I did it one year and I did it. And I was, cause I was like, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes. It was the Expo West, my first Expo West. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, 500 cases. That was, that's so much. That's more than double what we did last month or something like that. And I just, yes it. And then I went and then I like turned around and opened my calculator. And it's like, oh, mm. what did I just do? And I was like trying to get the UNFI rep on the phone to go, how do we take that back? What did I do? And I was like, this is a learning experience know my numbers ahead of time, know what my no point is yeah, and stick with it. Cause it's not worth it. When we got that MCB charge back later and I was like, guys, you know, I had to talk to my four or five person team at the time and go, this isn't going to happen again. Yeah. I promise. I know. I, yeah. I <laughs> learned. I understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen. I'm curious if as a company or as a sales team or both, you have maximums on like how much growth you want to have in a particular year or sort of how you go about setting like goals or projections. Um, cause it seems like it's controlled to a certain extent so that you don't overextend mm -hmm. yourselves financially. Yeah. I mean, I, our, our maximums still these days are, are really controlled by our production capacity. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes there's also been just deals that just don't work out because we know we can't fulfill it. And those are long memories mm. in terms of saying yes to something that you actually can't pull off. Yeah. And there have been times when we say, this is all we can produce or we're having supply chain issues and we can't, we're not going to be able to get this product to you. And so that's oftentimes kind of where we're capped on growth in previous years. Now we're sort of building up production, but now we're also trying to grow in a way that again is works for what our goals are. So we get approached every day. Can you do my private label? Can you make this special product for me? Can you put my logo on this, whatever? Yeah. And maybe the numbers shake out really nicely. But again, we look at ourselves and go, what are we trying to build here at Repurpose? And we're trying to disrupt this category with a brand name. Yeah. So doing your private label, wow, the volume is incredible, but it doesn't work for what we're trying to to do here. We still think that people want their sustainable products from a sustainable brand because they can dig deep on it and find information from the website. The founder is accessible. You can find our certifications, you can our inputs, our supply chain, what makes us green, what doesn't, etc. We're humble. We can tell you we're not perfect, but we're doing our best. Yeah. Saying no sometimes in a way that just knowing what your goal is can really help keep you on track. And for us, not doing private label, just, it doesn't excite us. We want to yeah. be a brand that people love and identify with and that we can connect with on social and all these places. And, and same with, you know, can you put our logo on your cup in all of our coffee shops or whatever? And we're like, well, then the repurposed brand is gone and we're a retail focused brand. So you can pick us up and shop it and put it home in your pantry and knowing what you're really trying to build. Yeah. And if it's those dollars, if we were after those dollars, we would do private label left and right. And I like saying no to those opportunities because I'm excited too to build a brand and be bring personality to just an age old sort of like, again, these these same things, your grandmother bought Dixie plates and you know, yeah. 1952. So <laughs> it's fun to disrupt and be a brand and, say no to things sometimes because we've got this vision and we really want to support it. Yeah. I think that clarity on the vision and what you want to be as a brand is so huge. 
And it's something that we talk about quite a bit around here, you know, because focus, I think gives you intention and the ability to say yes or no, right. Very kind of easily, much more easily, right. You can say, okay, yes. Like you just said, it's, it's dollars, but it's not the right kind of dollars. It's not moving our, our big goal forward. I think that's a huge, huge, important thing for, for brands to understand. So thank you for sharing Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And if it is dollars go for it, if you've got the margins to do private label and you and your goal is to build as big of a company as possible and have as many people on your payroll as possible. Yeah. Like I'm not here to tell anybody that their goals are wrong. It's yeah. more just if you really clearly define it, then it helps you be able to make those decisions at those points where you you get the starry eyes and you go, what's the reality? What's the goal? Let's come back down to earth. Let's for us, let's run the numbers or let's say, what is the goal of this brand that we're building? And then it sheds a lot of light on it. Yeah. And it seems like everyone on your team knows the goal so that when you're going out to sell, no one's upset when you guys say no to something. It's like, well, we know what our goal is. We know that this didn't meet it. We all understand why the answer was no. Yeah, this is so true. And we really try to make sure that all departments feel that they are aligned with the goal and they're working towards it too. Because I think as a, as you grow as a company, we're 25 people now, you can feel disconnected from whether it be the mission because you're in accounting and you're processing yeah. MCBs all day. Like you don't feel that you're like growing some like movement, you know, and we really try to keep that kind of company culture where accessibility is that we welcome all, like you don't have to be a zero waste warrior yeah. to join the repurpose team. It's more like, let's all do well by doing good and support each other and grow this movement and have everyone feel it, that they're part of it and that they contribute to it and can live a good life doing it. Yeah. Oh, it's so great. Any last like words of wisdom or anything that you want to share before we sign off today? It's okay to question what doesn't feel right. If you can afford it, if you can do it, if you've got all the capital in the world, go for it. Yeah. If it doesn't feel right, question it. And if you're and if you ask somebody who tells you it's just how it's done, ask somebody else. <laughs> if someone tells you it's just how it's done, ask somebody else. There are tons of people, this industry, I was just at the Kehi show, which was at the same time as the UNFI show, which was the same time as the VMC show, which tells me how many people are in this industry, because there can be three shows that are filled. Ask somebody, is this, is this normal? Have you ever done anything about this? And ask another person if someone tells you it's status quo. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's an amazing tip. I feel so energized every time I talk to you. I don't want to put labels on you, but I think you're inspiring. You can be inspiring to people. I think your willingness to not only share your story and and how you approach things at repurpose and, and what your journey there has been, but also your willingness to be available to people is really awesome. We got to get you in the community. I'd love to have you yes. uh, for a and A. We'll we'll plan that out. Um, and oh yeah, we'll just open all open it all up. I love yes. it. Like crack yes. the silos. <laughs> Let's talk about it. And I, I want to be an, an access point because I really, I love what some of these amazing small brands are doing and I hate the barriers in the way. Yeah. And there's, I do still have hope that there's a way for small brands to continue to disrupt and that like, I'm going to continue to have a just better shopping experience every year that goes by because cool ass companies are just doing cool ass things. Yes. And you want to be excited when you head to your little grocery store or what have you. Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's what kind of keeps, keeps us all going. Well, I'm super excited that we were here today together. I'm super excited to have you back in the community. Gwen, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Are you, are you on the social media? Are you? Yes. Well, repurpose is easy to find. It's just repurpose at repurpose everywhere. My I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on the startup CPG Slack. I'm easy to find there. Gwen Richardson. And my Instagram handle is Gwen goes green. Oh, I love it. You can find me there too. Yeah. 
And thank you so much. This was, I'm so excited about just knowing that there's some voices that are coming together, holding hands, opening up the silos, and I want to contribute and support and help. And I just love that you are taking on a, an important voice here because it's, I don't, I'm not ready to be the leader alone, but I really want to just embrace those that are ready to sort of question this and and grow things right. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your support. Our listeners appreciate your support and your guidance and your knowledge and your experience. So thank you again for being here. I hope you have an amazing thank day. You. you too. Take Bye. care. When will be joining me for a fireside chat open to all members of the Good Food CFO community. You can learn more and join via the link in the show notes or by visiting join.thegoodfoodcfo.com. Good Food CFO Plus and Good Food Revolutionary members. You can also catch Gwen in the bonus content of this episode, where she's sharing her top tips for successful negotiating. As always, I am so grateful to have spent time with you here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please consider sharing it with your founder friends on social and rating and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help more good food founders find the show. I'll be back with a brand new episode in two weeks.